Good morning, and um, I and, and we are, are truly delighted to, to be here today and, uh, and feel certainly very privileged to, uh, to have the opportunity to, to address you today and to talk about our story. And I was just reflecting on, on the movie uh, when, when David was, uh, the film when David was, was making the introduction. Um, and I think certainly for, for me a very, very strong and emotional reminder of what we're really trying to, to achieve also about today. So I'm not sure how you felt when you watched the movie, but I certainly felt deeply touched. I'm sure when, when we look across the room today, there's none of us really that's in, in doubt that what's at the heart of everything we do is safety. But I think what we also recognize is that it takes more than good intentions to really drive a sustainable and strong safety culture. And we would like um, over the next half an hour or so to share our story, our journey <coughs> of where we have come to and what West Going UK has been through. And I'm very glad to be joined by, by Bob, um, who is safety rep on GP3 and has been working with Merce Going since 2006 initially joining on, on Griffin, but is also a member of, uh, of the 12 safety reps that's a member of the Step Change leadership team. So we'll try to make this a bit of a, a joint presentation, but uh, allow me first to give a bit of, uh, I guess, scene setting introduction. So our journey and, and our story is, is really around culture and mindsets. It's about how do we create a culture where it's safe to speak up, where it's safe to challenge, where it's safe to challenge the way we do things around here, but certainly also where there's much more care and relationship, where people actually want to look out for each other, where we feel as part of a team, and where we all play our part, as, as we heard about today. Um, I would like to say and, and stress that we are not unique, and, and I'm not trying to stand here to be unique. We still have a lot of challenges in, in our company, and certainly what I see across uh, the, the industry through my engagements in step change and safety and in oil and gas in UK is that we have a lot of work sites and facilities and installations uh, in, here in UK where we have very, very strong pockets of excellence and where we see strong energy and passion <coughs> of really wanting to make a difference and, and create it. So I think it's, it's so important that we share that and I think share the ideas, share the, the learnings, but also share the inspiration that we can all take away of how to go back and do things just slightly different. If we all make a small change today, the impact is huge for our industry. And I think that's really what is the spirit of, of today. It's the spirit of step change. It's about bringing together, sharing and learning from each other. And hopefully that's what we'll all get out of today in the sessions in the, in the afternoon. So what we would like to take you through is, is sort of three things, a bit of background and history, what really caused us to change, and I think uh, Dave uh, alluded to that. Um, I'd like to, to share what we have done, and especially what made a difference in, in our journey. And then I guess the challenge we all have is how do we keep momentum and how do we move forward from, from where we are. So those would be sort of the key aspects of, uh, of what we'd like to share. When I look at our philosophy on, on how we would like to drive our business, there's no doubt that the safety is absolutely paramount. It's paramount for our people, it's paramount for the environment, it's paramount for our reputation, and certainly it's, it's really paramount for, for, for conducting a successful business. So our goal is to run incident-free operations. And by essence, that's really our license to, to operate. But we certainly strive to create a trusting culture where it's safe to speak up, where people feel empowered to address issues or, um, or make issues visible so that we can take actions and, uh, and, and improve. <laughs> and I think when, when I think about workforce engagement and, and what does that mean, that's really about engaging and actively listening to all the people we have in the organization. It's about listening to the guys at the work phase because they are the ones that really understand what's happening in the business. They are the one out at the work site that sees and lives with our processes and procedures day in and day out and have to make the choices on an hour basis. So that's really a key part for, for driving that. Um, I think another key part certainly for me is that, that we don't only expect Merck Oil employees to adapt an incident-free mindset and, and culture. We expect that from everyone that works from Oil. So that's whether they're on our installation for one day, for a year, or for 10 years, it 
it's the same expectations. So we expect it from the supply chain, from people in our offices, and, and certainly in, in our in our projects. Uh, and I think uh, trying to define and develop a culture like that, you, you can't buy that off the shelf. It doesn't just suddenly land in your lap. It, it really uh, requires a lot of effort on all levels. And it's not just senior management, it's across the whole organization. Uh, and I, I think hopefully what we will share is uh, that certainly was not where we were five years back in, uh, in our operations here in Aberdeen. So I think that comes to the first, uh, the first part. It's really, you can't change before you recognize that you have to change. So this is the, the thing about holding up the mirror and looking yourself in the mirror and say, is this really what, what, what I look like? Is, is this okay or do we need to change? And certainly if we look at, at, at our performance, safety performance from 2006 through to 2009, we ended in late 2005, I should add. Um, that, that wasn't really a pretty picture, to be honest. And it was certainly not up to the standards of how we would like to conduct our operations and, and be seen as a, as a prudent operator. So I think that's, that's really key, certainly for me, on you can't change and you can't recognize you have to change until you really understand where you are um, and, and what your current situation is. This slide does not show up very well, I'm afraid. I'm just trying to... <laughs> So, I'll, I'll try to explain it. This is basically showing um, a, a bit of statistics, and I won't show a lot of statistics here, but I guess it, it's trying to illustrate uh, where we were on a benchmark scale. So, in 2009, that's a small picture, unfortunately, you can't see. So, this is a, this is a an, what do you say, anonymous survey on, uh, this is on uh, injury frequencies, that's run here in, in UK by, by HSE and, uh, and Oil and Gas UK. And it sort of places and ranks the different operators on, on how we're performing. And what the graph, the small graph is trying to show you is that in 2009, we were amongst the worst performers in UK. And what the big graph shows is a statistic that has just come out where, where we had no reportable uh, injuries and, and, and we now see ourselves as, uh, as being part of, of top quartile. So, so that's, I guess, a bit of an output and, and evidence that that's all the effort has made a difference also in the, in the statistics. And it also shows certainly to me and, and hopefully all of us that it is possible to make huge improvements, but it takes time and it takes a lot of effort. So I think instead of me describing statistics, it's probably better to hear a bit from, uh, from, from Bob, who arrived in, in 2006 on, on Griffin, how it felt coming out there at that point in time. Well, um, my, f my first got a job on Maersk Oil in 2006 for Arca Caverna as a pipe fitter. And my first thoughts as I walked around and spoke to people on the tools, got to know what was going on. Uh, I'm going to my work pattern. Everybody knew their jobs, but not really what was happening elsewhere. I mean, they knew what they were doing themselves, but not elsewhere on the installation. And it also felt to me like there definitely was a bit an attitude of the us and them, and especially towards contractors, because us as contractors, we'd be coming and going, and you know, you know how it is. So normally we'd be, you'd feel we were bottom of the ladder and the information stakes. I'm not saying people didn't care about you as much, but you seem to be the last to find out things. So then, us as contractors, did we feel as much a part as the insulation? Did we uh, take as much ownership in the jobs and the place that was going on around there? There was also, there was a lot of vacancies for safety reps and the stats on the board, uh, I mean, the one of the best, they, they, they knew they could do better. So all in all, in my impressions as I first arrived there is, the safe systems are going in place. Everybody knew the permits and knew what they had to do. Uh, the guys, they knew the jobs, the rules and responsibilities. Their attitude was good. Generally, there was no bad attitude. However, was there room to go uh, on safety involvement and involving everybody? Well, I thought yes. So, I guess in, in Room for improvement was, uh, was, was the situation. I think it was recognized by, by, by everyone. We really had to, to step up. 
So I'd like to share just very briefly on, on what, what have we done. And I guess the key point is, uh, again, there's no surprise, there's no silver bullet, of course, to do that. I think we all know that. Uh, it's a lot of effort, it's a lot of hard work from everyone uh, in, involved, really, to move a culture and, and to move a, a company. So the, on, the, on the screens you'll see a list of a few of the things we, we have done, and I think a couple of, of key things that have really made, made a change. We were struggling with hydrocarbon release, releases as well. We were among the poorest performers there in the UK, um, on, on top of uh, what we had before. Um, so we put in a lot of resources and, and, and people to focus on dedicated project teams to go and look for hydrocarbon releases and prevention. So looking at uh, compression, vibration, small bore tubing, etc. And really looking at our integrity manager on, on management on the installation. Because you can't drive a strong safety culture if you don't invest and, 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 uh, in, in making improvements on the equipment as, as well. Um, we engaged more strongly with step change and, and uh, used uh, an HEC and used some of the tool kits, kits there. And I would say we were also very encouraged or, or to, to do so uh, by the regulator. And then we, we tried also to work on the more, what I say, uh, feeling or, or less tangible things. So uh, we, we spent a lot of, uh, of time and effort down at Spade Adams, which is a, a testing site, explosion testing site, really to bring down both our leaders and, and managers from the office and our teams from the office, and also from offshore, to come down and actually experience explosions and, and what the impact is of a jet fire, or what the impact is of just a 10 kilo gas release that, that uh, ignites in a confined area. And I can tell you, when you stand there and feel the rumbling and the impact on yourself of standing close to that, and you see the noise of a jet fire, that there's no way you can communicate doing that. That makes, that makes a personal impact and makes a difference. I've been down there a couple of times, and each time it really uh, make, makes a difference to me. On top of that, we have some, some specifics. So we have post uh, Texas refinery incident, <laughs> global immersed oil, and, and the boards uh, initiated a, a very... Uh, a, a very significant audit of all our installations and, uh, and sites. So we have a, a, a huge audit team in UK where we looked across all our operations. And the action plan coming out of that on process safety issues was 20 man years that we implemented over the next two years from, uh, from that. And then I think what made the most change was, was probably the, the last two things in, in terms of, of mindset and culture. So safe to go was really a program that was, was made by the workforce. So it was not a senior management initiative, etc. It was a number of people coming together at, at a workshop and really saying, what is it we need to change the culture and behavior? And safe to go is, is basically a behavioral uh, intervention program. But we started to have, doing workshops and sessions all across the company, the expectation to speak up, the expectation to intervene, and the expectation to look out uh, for, for each other. And then on top of that, we added the incident free program, uh, as we call it, which is really also working about the mindset of not just understanding what, what happened in an incident, but really going much further beyond that and understand why did we make the decisions we made. So, and I think that that's really what, what it takes to move forward. So, if we look at where we are right now, I, I would say that. Uh, say workforce engagement and, and listening actually to all people in the organization has really moved forward. Uh, we hosted a number of workshops uh, last year uh, with, with more than 350 people, different workshops from, from all across the business again, work sites. And one of the key benefits of, of doing that is actually to mix people together as well from the different installations, onshore, offshore and, and, and the team. Uh, and, and part of that was actually to define the safety program we have for this year. So our safety priorities and the safety program for this year is defined by the <coughs> workshops and defined by the workforce. Um, another thing is, is really the engagement with the safety reps and, and the role where, as, as the safety reps. Um, and just having the time to, to actually uh, support and, and help uh, the, the reps in the work that they do. And, and also taking the time to for, for me personally, every time we have a safety rep meeting, trying to get across for breakfast or sitting down and have lunch, and just to hear again what's really, what, what are really the issues that, that's, that, that's out there on, on the work sites. And, and certainly I feel that, that, that we have a relationship now where we can be open and transparent, and there's nothing we can't discuss on what we want to do to drive the business and improve the business. <coughs> 
And then I think last part, what we're really focusing on now is also to engage much more widely uh, across the industry. So not only through step chains and, and, and what we do there, but also in the supply chain. And, and we have ended up with our improvements now that that's last year around 75% of our incidents, not necessarily lost time incidents, but incidents across the company are related to supply chain and, and especially vessels. So we're really trying to be, uh, be much more active now in workshops and working closer together uh, collaboratively with, with our suppliers and the supply chain. Again, to drive the incident-free mindset, to share what, what we are doing and also between what we find between contractors, there's a lot of sharing to happen uh, be between there as well. Again, there's a lot of things happening in our industry. There's a lot of passionate people, but we need to combine it and create forms where, where we can share that. Um, so I guess that, that's some of the things we have done, and, and Bob will tell us a bit about how, how that feels offshore. Yeah. When I started most, uh, noticing a profit, uh, positive change, as longer term I came, uh, I definitely seen the willingness from MERS to improve. I started to see a much greater visibility and focus on safety and the eagerness to improve things and involve the workforce in this. There was a greater involvement of safety reps and I wanted to become one. I wanted to be more actively involved by being a safety rep because I believe that MERS wanted to improve uh, on their safety and we're putting a lot of time, money and effort into this. Plus, it's easy to sit in the tea shack and moan and complain. And I can moan and complain as good as anybody, but honestly, it's so much better than moaning and complaining to the right people, because you feel that you're in some place. Yeah. And you do have that opportunity as a safety rep to do that. Uh, so I became more, more involved, I was given training, the more apparent it was that from the very top, onshore and offshore, uh, the safety of the workforce was the number one priority and a real desire was put into play to progress this. So that's where my safety go came on the cards. That, that involved every person. This was everybody had anything to do with MERS, offshore, onshore, contractor, supplier, office, IT, you name it. Everybody was involved in that. I saw this proof as, as proof uh, that anybody who wants to be a part of MERSC have to share the same goal and the same opportunities to take ownership and responsibility uh, for themselves and their workmates. The willingness to intervene, stop jobs when they see something that they are not sure, sure about. So then the intervention cars, they were introduced, and again the workforce were all trained on how you do an intervention, how you go up to people, stop jobs, and this is still going on today. Uh, we also, uh, in the workplace, we have informal meetings with OIM, when there's one person for each department, it's not just safety reps, it's anybody. You go, you have an informal meeting, you raise any concerns, the safety reps are part of with regular meetings that they do have, we also have informal meetings where there's no agenda with the OINs, and that's, and we try and give any concerns that the workforce want to raise there. We have our uh, constituency meetings, and the minutes go out, uh, various companies go on short of Maersk and the other companies. Uh, morning meetings, <coughs> each department, uh, we have the safety cards are read out, the activities are read out for all the departments during the day. So any concerns or clashes, and this is before you go for your permit, and uh, any concerns for that day are raised. So uh, as part of the improvements in pro progression and safety goal, in uh, incident free was introduced in 2010. And what incident free means to me, is always taking the time to think, what could go wrong? How could I stop it? Raising the concerns, listening to the concerns of your workmates. If you see th something and it looks wrong, then it is wrong. It's, it's, no, it's no hard. Stop the job or do the intervention, knowing that you will have the support uh, of the management. And by, do by doing this, <coughs> listening and learning to the workforce and showing a willingness to improve, I believe Mayor Scar has shown us it's not just another scheme, but the, by the, the way of the long term, that together we can all go forward and keep our fo in a focus and willingness to have an incident free day every day. 
Thank you. So, I, I guess we, 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 have seen, we have seen a change, we have seen an impact, and we have certainly seen a, a, a change in, in our culture. So, that, that's the big challenge we have now, as you see on the screen. How do we really, where do we go from here? How do we keep momentum? How do we evolve the standards we have set? And I think that's, that's really a, a continual challenge for all of us. And I think we are very fortunate as, as an industry, certainly here in, in UK, to have uh, professional uh, support in organizations like OP2, Step Change and Safety, uh, Oil and Gas UK, and we also have a very strong regulator that, that have very competent people and specialists and experts to help and support and again hold up the mirror if, if, uh, if, if required. So I think that's one of the things we really have that's special here in Aberdeen and in the UK, uh, London as well, uh, is that willingness to actually share and be open and transparent about where we have challenges and, and certainly also what, what we have done to, uh, to, to improve. And I think one of the tools uh, that, that really make and will make a big difference is the, the Step Change uh, Workforce Engagement Toolkit. Because that again creates a, a local, it's, it's North Sea, it's between installations that you can actually see when you're off the site. But it, it creates a comparison, it creates some tools where it's actually okay to discuss some of these things that might be a bit more feeling like and, and hard to discuss. And it creates visibility of, of where the challenges fleet installation is compared to the other installations and the workmates that, that people you know, meet in, in the heliport. So I think there's a lot uh, as an industry and certainly what, what's happening here today of bringing so many people together with, with, with the topic we have today and also the Piper 25, the oil and gas conference, is a testament to that. So really it's about capturing all that engagement and, and passion and, and funnel in through some, some very, what we would say, coordinated ways of, of working and I think step change in safety is, is really key to, uh, to doing that. Uh, one other thing I would like to say is uh, when I look at the challenges ahead, there's no doubt that our industry is, is becoming more, much more complex. And, and, and you say initially, often our first response on an incident or an investigation follow up is to put in place more procedures, more regulation, additional barriers, and the barrier model really to, to ensure that it doesn't, uh, doesn't happen again. But I think sometimes this does create you say a, a false sense of, of, uh, of assurance, a false level, false level of, of comfort. Um, because I don't think increased complexity necessarily uh, helps the environment and certainly from, from our conversation. So I think what we, what we have learned from experience is that it's really the human factors element uh, that has the greatest influence on safety. Um, and I think if there's any way we can reduce complexity, if we can be much more focused on the barriers we already have in place and how to make those ones more efficient instead of adding on uh, additional processes and, and procedures that will have a, a huge impact. And by the end of the day I think it's really about how people behave, act, think that really drives uh, the, the culture of safety and I hope that that's been clear from, from our presentation. So I think sometimes keeping things simple can be very very powerful. We need to remind that. Uh, so I think we will have bumps on the roads also on our continued journey, but we need to address and deal with that uh, with, with, uh, with rigor, uh, basically. Well, one, uh, one, one last thing for me, and I'll, I'll hand over to Bob for, for the last part. This uh, strange graph, I hope you can see this time, yeah. Uh, we have tried to measure, so the workforce engagement tool is, is great. We saw some of the questions here today also about how to judge the safety culture. Uh, when we talk about incident-free, we try to put a sort of maturity ladder, which is, is, is recognized in place, saying if you are one on an incident-free maturity ladder, then basically you have no incident-free mindsets and you're totally driven by enforcement and, uh, and regulator on a reactive mode. Whereas if, if you're T, you are truly incident-free on mindset throughout the whole organization. So during the workshops I mentioned last year, we tried to ask uh, people across the organization anonymously again, where, where, where did you see us being in 2009 and where do you see that we are now? So that's the red, it's 2009 and, and the green is, uh, is where our organization saw us in 2012. So there's a major movement. 
what I think is very encouraging as well, and probably you can't, you can't see it at the bottom, but there's a small gray uh, area uh, around uh, number seven uh, down there, and that was our leadership team. So we asked our leadership team, which we, we have dedicated some time, which we call the incident free leadership team, where we only talk about safety, just to have peace and quietness and only talk about safety. So one of our challenges put to us from, from our incident free uh, leaders was, so where do you see us as senior leaders in Merge Coil UK? And that was done before we knew, uh, before the workshops. So I think very encouraging to see that actually the senior management and, and my, my team saw us being exactly in the same position as the workshops identifies uh, afterwards. Very encouraging and, and sobering. So how do we move forward? And, and our ambition, what we set up for, for, for next year, is that we want to move one step on the maturity ladder. That's a very tall order, and it's very intangible. So, so it's basically the workforce and, and all of us that's going to be the judge of that when we get to the end of that year. But, but this is what we're trying to achieve. So I think on, on, on that one, again, just coming back to what would it take to do that, and I think it takes very, very strong safety leadership. And safety leadership is not at, at MD level. Safety leadership is at all levels in the organization. We are all responsible for safety. We all either set or impact the priorities that we take as, as a company. And we all need to be part of, uh, of, of making sure we get that right every day um, in, in our jobs. And I think again, what, what really comes down to successful companies in, in, in my mind is companies that on the safety front really can inspire the workforce and capture the passion that we have in the organization and turn that into actions and commitments from the workforce. So I think important, again, everyone has a role to play in safety. Um, there's no silver bullet to, to making improvements. But I think what we can ensure, all of us, is that we are engaged through the different channels of, of being so. And it's much more, it's much more, I'm not sure where it's more effectful, but uh, moaning to me than, uh, than just moaning uh, something, something <laughs> might, might have an impact. But it's really about the personal commitment that we all make and wanting to drive forward. The, the business at, at all levels. I uh, just like to finish off by saying I hope that by getting together and sharing what we all do at such important and in memorable events like this today, and groups like the workforce involvement groups, groups like Step Change, uh, with the joined up thinking that I think deserves a mention for getting all the companies uh, thinking the same way together. The input for G12 safety reps who sit on the oil and gas leadership team and uh, you've got the leaderships at all the North Sea there <coughs> hearing safety reps voices uh, from the North Sea. You've got the HSC there, you've got the unions there. Uh, the lessons all the companies are learning and sharing can only help the industry and assure that events such as that happening in Piper Alpha 25 years ago can never happen again. And my experience in Merskoya now is that they do have some of the most robust safety practices and procedures in the industry, but they know they can still improve and they know their safety journey is testament to this with the involvement of their workforce. Thanks.